let's stand and sing good good father i've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but i've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased that i You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who, it's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. God is an awesome God, and um, I hope today that, that you, you've put things aside and you've prepared your heart and uh, to hear the message and to hear God speak to you. Let's sing this morning, Our God.
darkness to shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger Jesus prevails forever. Would you share that amazing aloha, the love of Christ? Would you share that with one another? Welcome to Kalihi Union Church. We're so glad you're here to honor and worship the Lord this day. May you be blessed during this service. If you are a guest or visitor, we truly welcome you this day. And so if there, I know you have some Canadian friends, eh? 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 You don't feel that very well, Kendall. Eh? Uh, Doug and Lori, uh, good to have them. They're, they're, they're way back from our first church 30 years ago. And so Doug and Lori, good to have you. And they're visiting. Yeah. God bless. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Is there anyone else? Maybe on this side. I know we have Barbara Ching has a guest. But anyway, it's good to have you. Glad that you're here. Some of you are returning. Some of you have been away. And praise God. Yeah. There are many things going on. And you could always check it in your bulletins to pray over to see. But one of those things is Alpha. And we, are, yeah. we have been doing it. But it is a great place to ask questions, have good fellowship with food, and just a welcoming environment. Yeah, and it's not too late. If you, if you haven't tied into an Alpha program, um, we, we'd love to have you. We have groups that go. There's one actually this afternoon and then in homes during the week. Um, and we're looking at the big questions of, what, is there more to life than this? And so invite, bring people who never go to church, um, and you'll, you'll be blessed. So. Yeah, be sure to tie into Alpha. And then another great thing tied into Christ is prayer. And we praise God that Lionel Gu had this calling, a vision from God, to 
do a 24 hour prayer. Where, where's Lionel? Lionel, you, can, you here? Oh, praise God. Come on, right up, in the back. come on up, Lionel. Uh, come on And up. So we did, we did uh, last Friday, we did 24 hour prayer from 6 in the morning until Saturday morning. And then yesterday, we did 24 hour prayer from 6 in the morning until 6 uh, this morning. And Lionel, tell us a little bit about the vision and what you're praying God will do. This is actually not my vision. It's, it's uh, for the past, how much time do we have? Uh, one minute. One minute. <laughs> for the number of years we've been back here in Hawaii, there's been this vision that God has something in store for the state. And uh, in fact, I was going to run the idea by you sometime to maybe show some of this clip. But uh, if this is true, that God has something for, for the state of Hawaii, one of the components to bring that about is unceasing, unrelenting prayer. And so that's what this is about. To say, if this is true, God has something for the state, and we have a part to play in that, then my thought was, let's get engaged. And so the thought was, get up at Gay and I, 1.30 this morning, drove down here for 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock prayer, and just ask the Lord to work his will to bring whatever he wants to the state of Hawaii. And so that's what this is about. And, and, and uh, there's a video that you can go to see about this guy, um, Pete Gregg. He talks about the Outer Hebrides revival part of England. It started from two old ladies, two sisters, 84, 86 years old. I thought, Lord, by your grace, would you allow Gay and I to at least be part of that, like those two old ladies, to bring your spirit to have your outpouring on the state of Hawaii, that not just us, but others in the state would be, be involved in bringing this about. So, so on the 30th of this month, uh, yes. people can sign up. And, we, and you can sign up for one hour. We're encouraging people to actually come on campus to do it. You can come in pairs, um, and, and you can have more than, than two people, obviously. So from 6 in the morning through the 6th the next day, that'll be on October 30th. On the 30th of every month, October, every month, November, November, December, December. For now, you can go to the KUC website to sign up for these time slots. Yeah, and, and so... At the chapel. Right, in the chapel. Yeah. All right, so we have a couple hundred people here, and, and if you take one hour in that time and you plan now to come here, I mean, we can really do this. And then the vision is that other churches will take a day of the month as well so that there will be churches praying on the first, the second, the third, all the way through the 30th. We're going to be the last, all right? So, and, and so that literally there'll be 24-7 prayer all through our state, and that's what we're praying for the Lord to come. Right. So, right? so we're in the process of trying to recruit and encourage other, other churches to join us. Choose a date of the month and pray that day. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lionel. Exciting. Okay, so that the Lord would move in, in praying. A couple other things on the lanai. Um, for women only, but men, we need forgiveness too, but it's a forgiveness <laughs> conference coming up on October 21st, and so you could go out on the night to see more about it. Mel and Jean Yukimoto and Gloria mm -hmm. Chapman, who I heard was married to the person who killed John Lennon, and she went through a period of forgiveness. Actually, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's incredible. Yeah, and so, so this is at our church. about walking through that experience and how forgiveness is, is a lifestyle as a Christian. Yeah. So women sign up for that. Also on the lanai, you could sign up for 31 Days Away Harvest Celebration. That's our annual outreach event to this community in which we have fun with games, booths, food, prayer. Pastor Jonathan does a psalm reading. Psalm, not palm. Psalm reading. And it's a wonderful time in which we could share Jesus. And, and Kendall, I, I really believe that, that the Lord is trying to push us out as a church. In Matthew 22, Jesus talked about... Uh, having the, this great wedding banquet and inviting everyone to come. For Harvest, we're going to have about 800 people here, and we'll feed them and do all kinds of things. But, but it's not just a matter of you being here and serving. We're really wanting to reach out and build relationships with people. And so it, it's a time for Alpha for us to go out. And he said, go and make sure people will come in. And often we invite people that don't come. And that's what happened in Jesus' parable. But, but then he says, hey, go out again and go further. And then the place is still not full. He said, go out again to the very edges and compel people to come in. And I think we're learning as a church. We, we, we need to do that. It's not just, oh, I invited someone that didn't come. But, but that God has given us an, an opportunity in the community. And Harvest is it's wonderful. And so come and please not just be there, but think of some creative ways that you can engage people. So Pastor David last year took his puppets around. I do my psalm reading tent, and I'm stuck in there. But we need people all around saying, okay, how can we engage and make this a, a godly and a fun time for our community? 
Let's bring clo people closer to Jesus. Yeah. Speaking of which, we have a testimony with Lois, who is proclaiming Christ. I love Lois's heart, and she continues to share Christ through her life. Lois, could you share a testimony of how God is moving? Can you go back and talk to me? Good morning. <clears throat> Uh, since 2013, I've been part of the Ministry of One Mission Society based in Greenwood, Indiana. And my role with the organization is quite varied, but everything I do supports church multiplication and the training and the um, uh, strengthening of believers and worshiping groups. And One Mission Society uses a methodology called Train and Multiply, and uh, you'll see it on the screen. That's an English version um, cover. And then you'll also see it next in Hindi. And it's, uh, the material is published in 63 booklets for each language group. And so it's a very thorough method of training new believers uh, to become healthy believers. And on October 10, I leave for a four-week ministry trip to the Philippines, Myanmar, and South Asia. In the Philippines, I'm working on logistics for a conference that will occur there in January and February and bring together 35 church multiplication specialists, workers from around the world who are effective in church multiplication. They will come from 12 countries representing four continents. And they'll be together for a week of discussion focused on improving their church multiplication strategies. How can we do what we do more effectively is the question that they will address. My involvement in this process began back in June, and I handle communication with these men and women prior to the gathering. I assist them with their flight concerns, help with documentation needs, reserve hotels, secure dependable ground transportation, approve the meal selections, hire interpreters. And this October visit will focus on research and decision making to help ensure that we have a productive event in 2018. And then I'm going on to Myanmar, but on the way I have the privilege of making a two-day stop in Singapore to visit the family of a KUC friend. It will be refreshing to have a few days of downtime with this Christian family. And then in Myanmar and South Asia, I'll join a group of women, a ministry team from the U.S. mainland. Our purpose is to train women in church multiplication using train and multiply. Women training women. This approach has great impact because women in both the countries that we're going to are oppressed and devalued. We come to them with a message of hope teaching from the Bible about the value that God places on them as his daughters. Though poor on this earth, they are daughters of the King of Kings. My primary responsibility during these gatherings is to serve on the prayer team, to pray for the conference, for the country, and then one-on-one -on -one with each participant during their own 20-minute prayer slot. We pray for their families, we pray for their ministries, and anything that's important to them personally. It will be our privilege to serve these sisters in Christ, love on them, and encourage them in their walk with God. So I'll deeply appreciate your prayers for me as I travel and work. My desire is to fulfill God's purposes for me in each setting. And honestly, uh, there's parts of this itinerary I would not pick for myself. In fact, I stalled on purchasing my 12 segments of plane tickets because I really wanted to make sure that God wanted me to do this and this is where he wants me to be. And he came up with some very good reasons why I should go and he didn't seem impressed with my hesitations. So off I go, anticipating God's loving care, looking forward to interacting with old friends and to the reward of building new relationships with godly sisters and brothers. Thank you, KUC, for partnering with me financially in this work of the kingdom. Uh, on the lanai, you can pick up, pick up a bookmark with my itinerary and some prayer requests specific to this trip, and then uh, my prayer card is also out there that's just for long-term use. And I want to end with the verses that God used back in 2001 to focus me and Pastor David on international missions. Psalm 67, 1-3 states, 
May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Thank you. Okay, so... <laughs> So you need to, we need to put her in your prayer journal. You leave October 10. October 10, and you come back. November 7. And Philippines, Singapore, Myanmar, Southeast Asia. South Asia. South Asia, sorry, South Asia. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> say the so name of the specific. country. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so we want to be praying for her, encouraging her, and we'll be praying for her next week uh, as she goes out. Thank you so much, Thank Lois. You. Yeah. And right now, Auntie Lois is going to do your children's moment. And so kids, come on up. differently than I usually dress. I don't know how many of you know me, but I don't usually dress like this, do I? Uh, um, I want to talk to you about two words today, put on. Those are, might seem like odd words, but the lady in charge of our trip said to me, Lois, before you get off the plane in South Asia, you be sure that you put on clothes like they, are, they wear there. So this is what they wear there. So I'll put on an outfit that looks something like this before I get off the plane. And then she said, put on insect repellent because there are a lot of mosquitoes in the airport. That sounds kind of strange, but I will put on insect repellent because I don't like mosquito bites and the mosquitoes there carry some bad diseases. And, um, sorry, just a minute here. My notes closed on me. Uh, in the Bible, we read about the Apostle Paul. He wrote, he started a church in a town called Colossae, and then he later started, uh, wrote a letter to them. We call it Colossians. And in that book, he used the same words that my team leader used. He said, put on. And he didn't talk about putting on clothes or insect repellent or sunscreen. He said, if you're God's kids and you want to get along with God's family, you need to put on kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness. There's lots of big words. And a, but a very important list of how we're supposed to treat each other. Now, my team leader also told me, Lois, you have to put on, you're not complete until you put on a scarf. You have to have a scarf. So here we're going to put on a scarf. So I'm properly dressed. Okay? This scarf ties everything together. See, it pulls together my top, my pants, and I'm properly dressed. Well, the Apostle Paul kind of said the same thing. He said, you know, I just gave you this list of important things to do, but there's one more thing, the most important thing of all, and he says in Colossians, put on love. And he said, if you put on love, it will tie everything together, and your lives and the way you get along will be like beautiful music. And I think you know I like beautiful music. I like to play the piano. And when I don't play the right notes, I don't, I'm not very happy with myself. But beautiful music speaks good things to everyone around you. So whether you're a young kid or a grown-up kid, I want you to think about Paul's words, put on love. And when you put your clothes on in the morning, say to yourself, put on love. Can you say that? Put on love. And so we're going to pray. Megan's going to pray. And um, we're going to ask God to help us be people of love. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for sending your son to love the world. Help us to put on love with others. In your name, amen. Today's 
today's scripture is from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 9. And it reads, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Would you stand with me as we continue worship? And let's sing about that amazing love that God has for us. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit lives within me. Because you died and rose again. Let's sing that again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, spirit lives within me. Because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be That you, my King, would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true Joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned.
morning, everyone. If we could bow our heads in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you for this day, and we give you praises for being a loving and caring God who hears our prayers. We lift up our KUC Ohana in prayer to you now, dear Lord. And we ask you to tend to your sick ones. We ask you to rest your weary ones and soothe your suffering ones. We ask you to pity your afflicted ones, dear Lord, and shield your joyous ones. We pray for your protection over our church and especially ask for your blessing for all our, our volunteers, our Sunday school teachers, our ministry leaders, our church staff, for all our elders, and for each of our pastors, Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Yoshi, Pastor Kendall, Pastor Brad and their, and their families. Guide them, dear Lord, into your perfect will. Father, we need your guidance, and we need your direction for this church. We want to be faithful and sacred and to be sacred to the trust that you've given to us. Grant us harmony and unity of purpose as a church. We ask you to bless this time of fellowship with you and with each other, dear Lord. Help us to be sensitive to the needs of our brothers and sisters and move us to speak a word of encouragement for those who need you. As we prepare for the offertory, dear Lord, we acknowledge that all good gifts come from you. And from these riches, we bring this offering today. Help us to use it to further your purpose in this place and for the benefit of those in need. So as we come together and continue with this service, we pray to you in the words our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh 
foundation of the world for sinners crucified oh, holy sacrifice behold the Lamb of God behold the Lamb oh, holy sacrifice Stand again and sing, my Savior, my God. I am not skilled. I am not skilled to one. What God has willed, what God has planned I only know at His right hand Stands one who is my Savior I take Him at His word Die to save me, this I read. And in my heart I find the need of Him to be my Savior. That He would leave His place on high and come for sinful men. You count it strange, so once did I Before I knew my Savior My Savior loved, my Savior lived My Savior is always there for me My God He was, my God He is My God He's always gonna be Always there for me My God, He was 
that you would come Lord fill our minds Lord open up our hearts for what is true and what is lovely and what is beautiful of you Lord thank you we praise you we honor you in Jesus name we pray Amen please be seated it's so good to have you as we open up God's word today we've been looking at what are the big questions in life and Fundamentally, is there more to life than just being happy and getting by and making money and surviving in our relationships? We came out of our marriage conference, and those of you that were with us, we had 200 and some people, praise God, and it was a really special time. And there are the Sumners at the end of, of Friday night. We had a time where they asked uh, the husbands and the wives to do something in an exercise, and they asked the, the husbands to put their hands over their wives' heart. And that was really fun. So we got to do that. We're not going to do it in church because, well, even though our attendance may double, we're still going to do it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, over the wives' hearts and just to pray, to pray silently for God's blessing over their wives and to pray into their wives' heart the things of Jesus. Now, they are precious. They are cherished. They are loved by the Lord and loved by, by the husband. And then the wives had to do the same thing and, and put their hands on the husband's heart and to pray, and to pray for three to three or four minutes um, the blessing of God into their, their husband's heart. And it, it, it was, it was a, a really special time of God ministering. By the way, if you're, if you're married, um, that's a really key thing that you want to learn to do. You want to learn to pray every day out loud with, with your spouse uh, we know that one in two marriages roughly in a lifetime will, will break up. But we also know, and the stats are all over the place, that the people who actually pray out loud together, um, it's anywhere from one in 200 to one in 1,500. I mean, the odds just totally change. That, that the Lord Jesus, when we take that time in his presence and pray for each other, the power of God comes and ministers to us. And we want to ask the power of God to come and for God to put his hand on our hearts, okay? So you want to do that with me right now? And you just put your hand on your heart, but you, you want to see the Lord's hand right over top of your hand, okay? So Father, we pray that right now you will come and that you will impress on us your love for each person that's come. Lord, your love that we see in Jesus and that we see in the cross when Jesus died for us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. We're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at three different passages today, but we're going to begin with 1 Peter 2, and then we're going to end up with 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 25. that talks about why Jesus died. And Jesus came as the Son of God. He came to give eternal life. He, that life begins here. That life stretches out through and beyond death into glory with him. Now we want to focus on why specifically did Jesus die. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 through to 25. To this end, you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we may die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Here we have these two words used for Jesus. He's our shepherd with the big S, 
and that he is the one. We all know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That when we have Jesus, we have absolutely everything that we need. And so he's, he's the, the pastor's pastor. But then we have the same word. It's, it's the word overseer. It's also used for bishop. You see it in 1 Timothy chapter 3 describing the, the leaders of the church. And that this word overseer, that he is watching over as a pastor, as a shepherd, and to make sure that we have everything that we need. And this is seen not only in Christ as he comes and reveals who God is for us, he becomes flesh so we can see God and understand his nature, but more than that, in what he did in dying for us on the cross. Because it's on the cross that we understand who God is. So why did Jesus die on the cross? The first very obvious reason is because God loves us that much. Jesus died on the cross for us so we can understand that the love of God is not just something theoretical, but God has brought his love down to earth and so much so that he wants to place his hand on our heart and he wants his love to be pushed into our hearts so we know just the depth and the might and the power of his love for each one of us. John 3, 16, we all know it, ready? For God so loved, let's try it again. For God so loved, you've got to get the so, okay? Because we all love. We all have love. We all have different kinds of love. We all have different extents of love. But God so loved the world. This is, this is a God love. And only a God love gives his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting love. So this, this love of God is the reason that Jesus died. He wants that love to be evident and to be understood, but more than that, to be pushed into our lives and in, into our hearts. So this love is real in the midst of our sin. God so loved the world. It wasn't after you loved him that he loved you. It was before we loved him, even before we were born, even before. It may be that you cursed the name of God before, but even when you were rebelling and turned against God, it says that God so loved you and so loved me that he sent Jesus to die on a cross to demonstrate that love. So it was in the middle of our sin, Romans 5 says that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the kind of love that God pours out for us, and he wants to pour into our hearts, into our relationships. God loves us. He rescues us from judgment and hell. Why did Jesus die on the cross? To show us God's love in the midst of our sin, but literally to rescue us from hell. Scripture says that there is a record of all that we do. Everything that we have ever done that has broken God's law. Everything that we have not done that God commanded us to do. And that every word and every thought and every action of our lives is recorded before the Lord. And now, I used to think when I was a kid, oh, how can God do that? But now with computers, hey, piece of cake. But as a result of our actions and who we are, we will all face judgment. And apart from Jesus, there is no hope for you or for me. Because Scripture says all have sinned. We've all fallen far short. And the standard to get to heaven, who can go to heaven? Perfect people. Only perfect people can go to heaven where there's a perfect God. The standard is not the person beside you. The standard is, is not some nice person that you think you're just as good as they are. The standard is perfection. And only the perfect Lord Jesus can go to heaven. And only through his perfection does he make it possible for us to go. And what God did, he loved us so much that there is no way of our saving ourselves from the judgment of hell. And so God brought Jesus who died on the cross for us. And it's like God put the cross in front of the entrance to hell. So that for anyone who receives his love and believes and trusts in him, there is forgiveness and there is grace. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's the best news in the world. 
But it's like the cross is there so that if you say no to Jesus, hey, get that hand off my heart, God. Don't you touch me. That if there is this pushing away of Jesus, that then there is no other option for you. You've chosen to be separate from the Lord. And there's no other option but your own, your own righteousness, which leads to judgment and hell. So God sent Christ for us in order to rescue us from that punishment. Thirdly, God's love is there, and Jesus died on the cross in order that he may give us eternal life. For God so loved, let's say it, for God so loved the world. This, this kind of love that reaches down to love each one of us and to touch our lives. The whole world, that includes you, that includes me. That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. He doesn't want you to go to hell. And it comes when we believe in Christ. But scripture says if, if, if we don't believe, then we're condemned because it's, we're judged by our own choice of what we've done with Jesus. But that he gives us eternal life when we trust in Christ. This eternal life, it starts now. It's a relationship. It comes, it, it makes a change and about face in our life. Not walking for ourselves, not walking in sin, but turning and walking and following the Lord Jesus. And in that, there is an adoption into his family. We become princes and princesses of the king. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The end of Psalm 23. Our great shepherd. Amen. So why did Jesus die? Because he so loved. Let's try it. God so loved the world. Whenever you look at the cross, the first thing it should teach you about God is just the unfathomable love, the depth and the height and the length and the breadth of how much God loves you and he loves me and he loves the person beside you and the neighbor that you live beside as well. Second thing we see is we see that Christ died to bring peace through his blood. Here if we turn to Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. We want to read these two verses together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's Jesus. Everything of God was in Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, together by making peace. What did he make? How did he do it? Through his blood shed on the cross. Why did Jesus die? He died to bring peace through his blood. When Jesus was nailed to that cross, what nailed him there was all of the punishment that you deserve and that I deserve in hell. All of that punishment was placed on him. All of the shame, all of the pain, all of the torment. And that sin was placed on him in order that justice may be fulfilled and that we might be forgiven. There is never peace without justice. <coughs> so through the cross, Jesus brings peace through his blood by making payment for sin. That is why we know that when we ask God for forgiveness, that he gives freely and we have a new start and we are set free. Any sin in your life you can bring before God this morning and you can say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me in my heart for my wrong desires. Forgive me in my mind for all that I've thought that I've, and forgive me for all my, my things I've spoken in my mouth. And Lord, forgive me for all that I have done. And you can know that there's complete forgiveness in Christ for you. In Colossians chapter 2, amen, in, in Colossians 2, verse 13, it says that he forgave us all our sins. How many of our sins? All of our sins. Not some. 
What Christ did, the reason Christ died on the cross is a payment for all sins, all sins before, all sins in our life now, and all sins that will ever come. So great is what Christ did on the cross for us. But secondly, we see in verse 14 that he canceled the record of debt. It says in Colossians 2.14, he forgave us all our sins having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. They tell me that there's ways of, of erasing what you do in the history of your computer. You know, there's ways of, of going back and, and kind of erasing stuff. And I, I guess you can sort of erase it unless you're really good. You can erase, but, but the computer records absolutely every transaction and everything that happens in your computer. Well, it, it says here, and, and you know, guys that are committed to pornography, um, they often want to go back and, and erase the history so that you know, other people can't follow up and find out what they've been watching and what they've been doing. Well, it says here that there is a written code that the Lord keeps of everything that cannot be erased. And that that code stands against us as a judgment. And that Christ has erased that code. That's in hallelujah. But it's also one of financial terms. It's one of debt. And if you have a debt that you cannot pay, and the day of Jesus is different from today, because you couldn't have outstanding debt on credit cards. And if you were in debt and you couldn't pay it, say you owed a couple thousand dollars, then you would have to go to the market, and you would have to get that money by selling yourself. And you would hang a dollar figure around your neck, and if you owe $2,000, you would have to go and you would try to find someone who would buy you for $2,000 as a slave. And then they would pay your ransom. And that ransom would ensure your life. And when it says that Jesus canceled the written code, all the debt that hangs around your neck that enslaves you, that the enemy says, see, you owe it. You owe it. You owe it. The Lord Jesus has paid it. It's like someone coming up and saying, hey, I, I just went to the bank and I just paid off all your credit cards. He said, you what? You paid off all my credit cards? Yeah. You, like all of them? Yeah, they're all paid off. And I paid off all the rest of your debt. You mean you, mean you paid off my car? Car payments too? Yeah, car payments, it's all made too. And, and well, what about my mortgage? You didn't pay off my mortgage. Yeah, I paid off your mortgage too. Your mortgage, it's all paid off. I said, well, what, what, about, what about all my student loans, and my kids' student loans? Are they all paid off? Yeah, I paid off all those too. Yeah, well, what about, what about all, the, all the debt that I have in, in Hawaii? Because, you know, each of us is, what, $30,000 in debt to the state? Yeah, I, I paid off all that too. Well, what about all, all, all the federal debt that you have? I don't know how many, how big that is. Yeah, I paid off all that too. It's all paid off. And there's no more written code that can be held against you. Jesus died on the cross not only to forgive our sins, but to cancel the record. Any record of your sin and my sin, any debt that we owe to the Lord as a result of, of our sinful behavior or as a lack of obedience in what we should have done. And we haven't done for him. That's why Jesus died. But there's a third one. It gets better. And that is found in verse 15 of Colossians 2. He forgave us all our sins. He canceled the written code. And then in verse 15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus took that written code and he nailed it to the cross. And in doing so, he made a public spectacle of the demonic and the satanic powers. He says he disarmed those powers. In other words, Satan was robbed of his greatest weapon against you and me. And that is the threat of death. Satan was robbed of the intimidation that he can have in our lives through the threat of death and of saying, you're going to hell. And you're going to be separated from God. And you're going to pay. All the things you've done wrong, you're going to pay. 
Uh uh-uh, on the cross. Jesus died to disarm Satan from having any power. Today's uh, Martin Luther, um, next, this month, excuse me, is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And Martin Luther, he took 95 theses in, in 1517, and he went to the front of his door, of his church, big wooden doors just like we have, and he took a nail, and I was really tempted to do it this morning, but I didn't do it, guys, don't worry. And he took a great big hammer and a great big spike, and he nailed those 95 theses onto the door. Why? Because those 95 things he listed on the door, it represented all of the sins that had entered into the church, the way they were doing things that wasn't biblical, that wasn't right, and what was ruining people's relationship with Jesus Christ, all the lies that the enemy was using. And he nailed it to the door. Well, Jesus nailed all of our sin to the cross, and he nailed all of the written code for Satan to accuse us, so that now Satan is disarmed When he comes and he says to you, you know what, you're going to hell. No, I'm not. (laughs) I'm forgiven. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. He says, well, hey, how can you be sure of that? You don't know. You know all those sins that you did back then? You remember them? And you say, "Uh uh-uh, I don't remember them. And even if I did, God's forgotten them. Because he says he's going to remember my sins no more. He has disarmed powers of evil. So that now our life is hidden with Christ in God. A lot of division in our country, to say the least. Can't even watch a football game. And you don't know who's going to kneel and who's not going to kneel. All the kinds of dynamics. Jesus Christ came to bring peace through his blood. He came to bring peace between even the battles that go on in heaven. He came to bring peace to every division that is there on earth. He bring bring peace between North Korea and the United States. He can bring peace between Israel and Iran. He can bring peace between the Kurds and the Turks. He can bring peace between the Jews and the Arabs. He can be, be bring peace between ethnic groups, whether that's Koreans and Chinese and and Japanese, or, or whether it's between Samoans and Tongans, or whether it's between black and white, or Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. He can bring peace between Republicans and Democrats. The blood of the cross can bring peace between the right and the left. The blood of the cross can bring peace between those who kneel during a national anthem and those who put their lives on the line in our military to defend our flag. He can bring peace between victims and abusers, and he can bring peace between thieves and the violated. He can bring peace between husbands and wives. He can bring peace between children and their parents and and brother against brother and sister with sister. He can bring peace between employers and employees. He can bring peace between police and protesters. He can bring peace between prison guards and prisoners. He can bring peace between teachers and their administration. He can bring peace in your home. He can bring peace in your school. He can bring peace in the supermarket. He can bring peace even in churches. See, the blood of the cross, why did Jesus die? Because he can bring peace between people who say, we need to build there or we need to build there. He can bring peace between people who say, that's my space and I'm not going to share it. And people say, you have to share it. He can bring peace between people who are gossipers and people who are worshipers. He can bring peace between elders and leaders and the people. He can bring peace between those who are just messed up and violent and those who come with joy in their heart. He can bring peace between those who are Calvinists and those who are free will. He can bring peace between people who disagree when Jesus is going to return and how he's going to rapture. He can bring peace between those who want to homeschool their kids and say that's the right way to do it and those who put them in the public system, those who put them in the private system. He can bring peace between those who dress up because they want to honor God and those who dress down because they want to, want to be comfortable and relaxed. Why did Jesus die? He died to bring peace through his blood. 
In 1 Peter, it says that Jesus died so that we might live righteously. Whenever you look to the cross, you want to see, for God so loved, can we say that? For God so loved the world. That, that hand of God on your heart that just loves and loves and wants to push that in. Whenever we want to look at the cross, we want to see the blood of Jesus, which now comes and brings that which is divided and enemies together under his authority and under his power. But the cross, Jesus died so that we might also follow his example and live in righteousness. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Let's read this one together. That Jesus himself, he himself, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Okay, in his body. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table in a minute. And we have bread. It's broken. It represents his body. That in his body, he bore our sins on the cross. So that we might die to sins and live for Okay, so we actually join into what Christ has done on the cross. We actually follow his example. When we take communion, it's more than just remembering. It's one of saying, now, Lord Jesus, you died on the cross so that I may live righteously. I may follow your example. By his wounds, we are healed. So the cross is an example for us to say no to sin and to say yes to Jesus. In the same way, it says in, uh, in 1 Peter 2, that when Jesus was crucified, when he was tortured, when he was mocked, that there was no sin in him and there was no deceit in his mouth. When they slandered his name publicly, when they mocked him, when they held him up for abuse, there was no deceit in his mouth and there was no sin in his heart. And God calls us to follow that same example that the Lord Jesus gives. First of all, that we may have daily victory over the power of sin. Now, through Christ, sin no longer needs to control or enslave you. Now with the, we have the blood of Jesus to apply to any sin in any situation that is in our life. So whatever control sin used to have in your life, you now have the option of saying no to that sin and by the power of the Holy Spirit, saying yes to Jesus and walking in the other direction in a new life. Steve uh, Scalas, uh, some of you know, uh, you saw the, the news uh, a month or so ago of when he was shot at the baseball practice of the, the Republican Party. And they were practicing, and, and a man came and shot him and shattered his pelvis. And, and just this week, a few days ago, he walked back in as the majority whip um, for the Republican Party Congress. And, and he was there. And it was amazing. I watched it live. And the news doesn't pick it up, but from beginning to end, he walks in, and he's on his, on his walker going slowly up to his, his special podium. And everyone... Democrats, Republicans, they're all standing with a standing ovation for this guy. And he didn't mince any words at all from beginning to end. It was about God. When you face death, and when the cross becomes your life, it is there for you to walk in it. And he said very clearly, I am here as a testimony to the power of prayer. And he said, this event... It's changed my life, but it may not have changed it in a way that you suspect. He said, this has strengthened my faith in God. Instead of, of being angry and bitter at that man who shot him and trying to take it in, in, in a political kind of vindictive way, he followed the example of Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus died to give us an example, but more than an example, to give us the power to walk in the midst of sin and to have victory daily over sin by something that's greater than sin. And that's the blood of Jesus. And wherever we find sin, 
We have something more powerful than sin that we can come and bring into our situation. And so we bring Christ's blood. And that's true for our sin. It's true for sins done against us. And it's true for sin in the world. That's why we pray. That's why we urge you to sign up for a 24-hour prayer. That we pack out October 30th. Because we have the blood of Jesus and we apply the blood of Jesus when we get on our knees, not in protest, but in seeking the face of God and surrendering before him and saying, Lord, you come. You come and move. Jesus died so that we may live the right way in freedom. There's all kinds of wrong ways to live. Seems obvious. You don't have to to tell you. But there's only one right way to live. And that's in a relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that's in walking hand in hand with him. And Jesus died so that we may have that relationship. And that we would understand that what he did on the cross that broke the power of death, that broke the power of Satan, that broke the power of hell, that broke the power of sin, that same obedience in our life is now used to break the power of Satan, to break the power of sin, to break the power of death, and to break the power of all of the demonic wherever we go. Do you understand? So he says, you walk in the same example. You take the power of the cross to you with work. You take the power of the cross with you to the football game. You take the power of the cross with you to school. And you have victory over sin. Because you have a Lord who is greater than sin. How do we know? Because after the cross, he rose again from the grave. And after he rose again from the grave... He ascended to the throne in heaven. And he's promised as he's returning. And when he comes back, it's all over for sin and for Satan. And it's just beginning for you and me. It says in Colossians chapter 2, by his wounds, we are healed. Can we say that? By his wounds. We are healed. Put your, put your hand in your heart. Remember, it's the Lord's hand on top of it. By his wounds. The wound, take that hand of Jesus that was nailed to the cross. With his blood on it. And you put it on your heart. And it's by his wounds that you are healed. And if, if that blood is available to us every day, then there's no wound that any person can give you or any place that you go in ministry can do to you that the Lord Jesus cannot heal. Amen? There's no wound that you have that is greater than the ability of Jesus to heal you. So that means now that you can step out in boldness for Jesus into places that are dangerous and difficult and threatening to who you are. Because we constantly have the healing power of Jesus. Some people worry. They say, Pastor, you okay? You've taken some pretty big knocks lately. Yeah, I've taken some pretty big knocks lately. You okay? Yeah, it was okay the same day. Why? Because I went to Jesus. And he heals our wounds, right? And then the next day, you take more knocks. You say, okay, yeah, I'm okay. Why? Because the cross is there, and the blood of Jesus heals our wounds. And then the next day, the only people that aren't healed of the wounds are the people who like to lick their wounds. And they somehow want to rejoice in their wounds. And they want to spread them out for all the world to pity them. No, it's by Jesus' wounds that we are healed so we can keep going. And Satan doesn't have that stepping on us and holding us down. And so wherever you go, whatever you do, whoever you're serving, yeah, they're going to hurt you. You go to church, yeah, you're going to get hurt. You go to work, you're going to get hurt. You go to school, you're going to get hurt. But by his wounds, what? We are healed. And so we apply the blood of Jesus. Jesus died for you and me so that we have the living power of Christ to heal us, not just once, every day, over and over through the day. So as soon as you get hurt, As soon as that knife comes towards you, stabs you, you just take the Lord's hand 
and you put it on your heart, you say, thank you, Jesus, heal me, okay? That's why we come to the table. By his wounds, we are Jesus came. He died for us. One, because he so <laughs> loved the world. Isn't that great? And, and Jesus died so that there can be peace in our hearts and peace in our relationships and peace with God. And it's through the blood of the cross that he makes peace. When you come to the table, you may want to come and we take the cup because it's the cup that represents his blood and that blood needs to pump through our hearts and we need his love pumping through who we are we need his heart in our hearts and it's his blood that brings healing and it's his blood that makes us at peace and so when you come you take your time and you give people space come right up and go to the edges so people have a chance to take time before God and pray but if you need the Lord to just cleanse and wash with his love, you, you take the time and do that. If, you've, if you need peace in certain parts of your life, you, hey, it's here. It's available. The blood of Jesus. And if you need walk in righteousness and in victory and have power over the enemy, it's here in the name of Jesus. The Lord Jesus, the night before he was to be crucified, he took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and he said this is my body it's broken for you all of our sins were placed on his broken body on the tree eat of this remember that you are forgiven in Christ the same way he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood whenever we eat the bread whenever we drink the cup. We are proclaiming Jesus' death on the cross. And we are claiming the power of the blood over our lives and in our lives and through our lives. And we are proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus who has conquered the enemy. And we are, praised, we are proclaiming that Jesus sits on the throne of heaven and that our lives belong to him. And that when I die... I am going to open my eyes and I'm going to see him face to face. And we are proclaiming that Jesus is coming again. And once and for all, what he accomplished on the cross, it will be finished when he makes a new heaven and a new earth and he throws Satan into hell. And all of us are given our new resurrection bodies. Father, um, we come to your table. We come at your invitation, not, not because we're good enough, Lord, we're not. Lord, not one of us has the right to come before you, but you have invited us, and Jesus, you died for us to make a way for us to come to you now. So we come because of your perfection, because of your righteousness, and we come because you've nailed our sin to the cross, and we thank you so much. Now come place your hand on our hearts, Lord. Come take those nail-scarred hands and by your stripes you heal us, Lord. By your blood you bring peace. And Lord, assure us of just how much you love us. And you love us so much that we would not perish, but we would have everlasting life. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me at the table of the Lord.
Holy 
sing your praise of forgiveness of sin, that they would know the peace that only Jesus can bring, and God, that they would walk in your righteousness this week, Lord, and have victory over the enemy, victory over death, victory over sin, Lord, for your glory. Father, we pray for the person on our left, God, that you'd place your heart, your hand on their heart right now, God, that they would know just the fullness of your love, and it would penetrate down through all they are, Lord, they would know in their mind, they'd know in their depth of of their heart, their soul of souls, Jesus, that you died for them. And Lord, that your peace would fill every part of their life. Lord, in their family, in their home, Lord, in their schools, at work, Lord, wherever they go today and tomorrow, God, each day, they would walk in the righteousness and the peace of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. And we pray your blessing on each one that come, those that are going to be traveling and leaving us, Lord, your blessing, those that will be coming home. Father, your blessing as we have lunch together, Lord, your blessing as we discuss and pray with each other. Father, that you would bless us with every heavenly blessing. Now, Lord, bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us, Lord. Be gracious unto us. Lift up your light of your countenance upon us and give us your peace, both now and forevermore. Everyone said, Amen. God bless you.